Hi, and welcome to the last program in this fifth series of Just The Job, bringing the total number of careers to date to 150. So for our 148th career today, Charles Penny from Mangere College discovers the career possibilities around the work of a lab technician in civil engineering. Then for our 149th career, we're in Wellington where Ashley George gets to grips with a career in painting and decorating. And for our 150th career, 17-year-old Daniel discovers the career possibilities as a secondary school teacher. So let's join Charles now as he takes a look at a fascinating side of the civil engineering industry. Hi everybody, my name is Charles Penny. I'm 16 years old and I currently attend Mangane College and today I'm going to be learning about how to become a civil laboratory technician. From the roads we drive on to the foundations on which they're laid, if it's built by engineers, you can rest assured it's been checked and controlled by a civil laboratory technician. A civil lab technician is someone who's involved in a variety of jobs. Uh, they might be out in the field collecting samples, bringing them back to the lab, test those samples and draw up reports and then uh, send them off to the engineers or whoever might be interested in that information. To give Charles a feel for the job, Michael will give him a tour of the environments in which they work. Civil engineering testing laboratories place great importance on safety in the workplace. So after a health and safety briefing, Michael and Charles headed to the lab where road materials are tested. And what kind of test do you do? Well today we'll be doing a softening point test. Um, it pretty much tells you at what temperature does the bitumen soften it. Um, it's a good indication of what temperature um, the bitumen is going to be able to withstand out on the roads. You, you don't want it melting on your feet as you're walking on it, you know, because it absorbs a lot of the sun. Um, well, quality control is a, um, an important part of a lab technician because um, the work that we do here really affects um, the materials that perform out on site. And so in order to build a good road, we need to test every aspect of that road in order for it to last a long time. So what are we looking for and what are we trying to find out with this test? Well, basically what you're trying to see is at what temperature do those balls fall through those rings and hit that bottom plate. Okay. And at that temperature, it'll tell you the softening point of the bitumen. If the materials that we use didn't comply to the specification, what you would find is so instead of it lasting 20 years, it only lasts six months, and uh, you spend a few hundred thousand dollars uh, on a road that um, could have been done right the first time. All right, so that's perfect. There's only about 0.2 degrees difference between them, which is exactly what we're looking for. Product testing is just one area a technician can specialise in. Testing the foundations on which roads and structures are built is another of the civil lab technician's responsibilities. What these guys do is they determine how certain soils are going to behave uh, once it's built on. And the civil engineering technicians will provide a report for the engineer and he can look at it and say, OK, so this is what we need to do to be able to construct this you know, high-rise building on the side, or we'll build this bridge here, or whatever. Methods of testing vary depending on the material under scrutiny. Many tests are mechanised, but others like soil compaction tests are surprisingly simple, ideal for beginners like Charles. It's really important to get it right and make sure you pay attention to the detail because these results are used further down the track that making sure that your road's not going to be wobbly if you get a test wrong and the standard compaction wrong and you're going to the wrong compactive effort, you could have a really squishy road and things like that, so it's very important that you make sure your results are right. The laboratory often sets the benchmark for testing in the field. So you may have a soil sample come to a laboratory, you test it for a maximum density, which is you're basically testing in the perfect world. And then on site, where conditions are a little different than the laboratory, you're giving the contractor a target to aim to. So we've spent a bit of time in the lab so far. Yep. How have you found it? I've enjoyed it a lot. There's a lot of interesting stuff that's been happening so far. Well, that's great. We, um, you know, it's not only based in the lab, no. we also spend a lot of time out in the field. Um, and so today we're gonna we're gonna show you a bit of that too. Okay. G'day Charles, nice to meet you. You too. So today we're gonna do some tests in the field. Yep. And I understand you've done a few in the lab. Um, I've done my standard compaction tests where I was planting the soil or clear off the hammer. Yep, that's right, and seeing how much soil you can get into the mould. Yep. Okay, so today we're going to do that in the field and see whether the contractors have managed to achieve that density. Okay. So the first thing we're going to need is our nuclear densometer. Field testing is really a quality assurance check to make sure that the contractor or whoever is, is working on the site is meeting the design criteria that the engineer has specified and then, as a laboratory technician, obtain a whole lot of data, bring it back, give it to the engineer, and then he can say, we can move on to the next stage, 
or uh, we have to dig that out and, and compact it all again. OK, Charles, so we've got our test site all ready to go. Yep. So now we need to push the probe into the ground. We want to walk th about three metres away while the test is running. OK. And then when we come back and record our data, we'll pull the handle back up, back into the safe mode. Sweet. So this fill, Charles, is structural fill, so something needs to be built on this. Okay. So effectively what we're looking for, the two main things are the density and the moisture content, which shows the amount of compaction the contractors have been able to achieve. Okay. So that relates back to that standard compaction test you did in terms of the density you could fit into that mould. Sweet. That all, makes, all sudden makes sense now. Out in the field, it is a bit of hard labour. It can be quite labour intensive but I think quite rewarding it at the end of the day. You've got to be hard working. You've got to be flexible. Think outside the square. The answer's not always in front of you. And I think someone who just enjoys science and maths and dirt, really. Oh, Charles, end of the day. How'd you find it? Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Job well done. Thanks. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> To become a qualified civil laboratory technician, you'll need to complete a national certificate in civil engineering laboratory level four, which can be gained on the job as you work. For those wishing to progress further, the national certificate in civil engineering laboratory level five allows for advancement to senior technician and opens opportunities to progress to laboratory manager. An interest in sciences will certainly help your career progression and you can expect to work in a wide range of environments around the country. Hey, great stuff, Charles. You did well. Now, most of us have had a crack at doing a bit of painting, but how about a career as a painter and decorator? Because after the break, Ashley's going to find out if it could be just the job for her. Welcome back to Just The Job, where Ashley's getting her overalls on to discover the career possibilities in painting and decorating. I'm Ashley George, I'm a Year 13 student at Newlands College. I enjoy arts and doing sports and dancing. Today I'm going to be a painter decorator, so I'm going to give it a go. Showing Ashley the ropes is Caroline Robinson, an experienced painter decorator. I've actually been painting for about 25 years. Four years ago Hi. she set up an all-female company nice called nice Women in White. Hi, are you ready for painting and decorating? I definitely am. Here we go. Overalls, hat, boots. Yay. Let's, let's get started. Come on, let's go. Caroline says preparation is 70% of the job, so Ashley's first task is to sand a wall ready for painting, a dusty and noisy operation that requires some specialised gear. Is it sealed? I think so. OK, now you can put your glasses on. Now, earplugs. Put one in one side first, and make sure it's pushed in. It won't affect your hearing when the sander's going. Cool. Yes, I can't hear anything. I have no idea what you're saying. <laughs> I have a passion for painting and decorating. I just love it. I mean, it's my life. I love it. Always loved it. A lot smoother? Yeah, it's hay smoother. Yeah, a lot better. Ready for painting now. In a traditionally male industry, Caroline and her team have found a niche in the market. Attention to detail and understanding the client's needs contributes to their success. They've got to have a passion for it. It is tough out there. That if, okay. you know, if you wanted to do something like this, it's a tough job because it's, um, it's a man's job. So it is a tough job to go into, but, you know, it's got its rewards. Claire is an apprentice. Yeah, Caroline sent me in to learn how to wallpaper. Oh, cool. She has a real passion for painting and decorating and, in particular, the challenge of wallpapering. Like, I really enjoy my job and they're a good company to work for. We have a lot of fun at work. Claire completed a 17-week introductory course on painting and decorating before applying for a job with Women in White. Although this is not essential, it will improve your chances of getting an apprenticeship. I really like the idea of doing a trade and doing something physical, working with my hands rather than an office job. And painting is like the most visual of them all. Like I like the idea of working with colours and design. Perfectly hung. Oh, okay. good job. Oh. <laughs> that wasn't okay. Shit, was the first time I've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the training is done on the job, supplemented by block courses. Progress is monitored by a Creative Trades ITO training coordinator who makes periodic visits to the work site. Uh, yeah, you do all your training pretty much on the job and then the block courses are just to assist you. You're not really there to learn, like you're supposed to have learned everything out on site. Do they teach you all the theory side, like you learn all your book work from them? Yeah, so there's a lot of classroom work, but it's practical as well, yeah. Women in White work mostly on residential properties with a lot of customer contact. 
So which one did you think? Oh, I was wondering about that one there, Bob. Yep. What do you think? Yeah, the, the light colour one, yep. So being able to develop a good client relationship is an essential part of the job. 99% of our work is residential. A lot of the time they're at home. You're dealing with either elderly people or people who've got children. So you have to be able to um, deal with situations with them or help them with the pictures down or take the curtains down or move the beds or whatever. And if you can't deal with the customer, that's it. You know, if th there's nothing you can do. Well done. Perfect. Fantastic. Well done. Yay. Next stop, across town yeah, to Paul Reddish Decorating Limited. You've taken your first step into a larger world. Specialists in commercial painting and decorating. Hey. Hey, how you going? I'm good. You must be Hayden. Yep, indeed. You must be Ashley. I sure am. Hayden yeah, Nightingale came right straight now. from school to take oh, up the trade. Right and he can proudly say that the whole city is his canvas. I can drive through Wellington and um, count 60 buildings that I've got my own little touch on, you know what I mean? And some, some people might think that's a little bit silly, but when you see something get built from the ground up, it's a quite good reward to, to know that you had your, your part of it, you know what I mean? The team's currently painting a high-rise building which is still under construction. OK, Ashley, this is our, um, this is our wall today. Cool. Um, basically, what we've got to do is we've got to sand it, and okay. seal it, and walk away. Really? Yep. Nice and quick. Let's do it. Awesome. OK, okay. cool. The views are spectacular from the 12th floor, and the yeah. toys are impressive right. too. They should provide a taxing workout for Ashley. You've got to have someone that's keen, keen to learn and listen. Listen. Listening is a big thing, you know what I mean? It makes it a whole lot easier if you, if you can listen, take some of it in. The quicker you take it in, you, you start enjoying it, you know what I mean? It's not so much a task. You can actually enjoy doing what you're doing. This piece of gear, called a flexor, is a sanding unit with a vacuum cleaner attached, which means minimal dust. My biceps! With the sanding completed, the wall is now ready for painting. But this wall is going to be sprayed, so wearing the right gear is essential. You feel a suction? Suction around there? Cool, that means you've got a good seal. <laughs> you don't like it? No. OK. This is a two-person operation. One applies the paint with the spray unit and the second back rolls. Come all the way down? Yep. Two experienced people can paint this wall in a tidy ten minutes. And a team could apply a coat to an entire level, either sealer coat or first top coat, in a day. Once we start putting our little bit of artwork around, it's, it's real rewarding to see a nice finished product. So did Ashley paint herself to glory? Um, she done really well. She picked it up and ran with it, really. It's good. It's good she can come and work with us anytime, really. Ashley did fantastic. She was really good. We had a lot of fun with us, though. Yeah, she had a, had a good day. Oh, I just had so much fun. Like, oh, just all these new experiences and doing all the stuff that I probably would never have got to do and learn all these techniques. I can go home and go, oh, Mum and Dad, guess what I learned? And this is how you should have painted the kitchen and this is how you should have wallpapered the lounge. So, yeah, I really enjoyed it. There are no specific entry requirements to become a painter and decorator as you learn skills on the job. It helps to have an understanding of maths, reading and writing. Passing NCEA Level 1 or 2 maths and English will certainly help. It doesn't matter if you don't have passes in those subjects, you can still be a successful painter. Talk to the team at Creative Trades ITO and in some instances they can help you in those areas and enable you to get an apprenticeship. You can achieve a national certificate in painting, but if you would like to build on your qualification, you can specialise in wall coverings, or spray techniques, or specialised coatings, or industrial coatings. Hey, well done, Ashley. Now, after the break, we're going to be in the classroom with Daniel as he discovers what's involved in becoming a secondary school teacher. Welcome back, you're watching Just The Job, and now for our 150th career, we're going to take a look at the career possibilities as a secondary school teacher. Hi, my name's Daniel. I'm 17. I go to Onzo College. I enjoy acting in theatre and communicating with other people. Today I'm checking out what it's like to be a secondary school teacher. Wellington High School's role sits at around 1,000 students. Today Daniel will be observing science teacher Matthew Easterbrook. So uh, what are we doing today? Uh, today I've got five lessons, so um, we've got a bit of planning to do before then, so let's right. go to it. Cool. Matthew was teaching undergraduates while completing his science degree. This experience gave him the passion to take up a career in teaching. Have a look back, it's great, I love it. With the day's planning out of the way, it's time for Daniel to sample the first lesson of the day with Matthew. I'm just going to introduce you to Daniel. Um, he's here today, he's a Year 13 student. 
Um, I don't know much about science, but I did Year 9 science, so maybe I can help you out with some of this stuff. Great. After Matthew introduced Daniel to the class, booklets are handed out for the students to complete. Each individual lesson, you're trying to isolate um, the most important thing to what you want the students to get out of it, and that would be your learning intentions. So, two learning intentions today. One, I want you to understand that matter is found in three states. I like to use a range of activities, so they are interacting with each other and um, me and um, some sort of practical aspect to help bring those concepts out. This Year 9 class is the first of the day, and Daniel is a keen observer. Have you done yours? Oh, it's all right, I'm not checking on anything. Oh, nice. Daniel needs to concentrate as he'll get a taste of what it's like to be a teacher under Matthew's watchful eye next period. Go for it. Right, um, first of all, does anyone know what the three states of matter are? Solid, liquid and gas. Right, nice. Does anyone know how we can change a solid into a liquid, a liquid into a gas and then all the way back again? Yeah. Well, turn a solid into a liquid, you need to melt the solid. Anyone else know how to change a solid into a gas? Yes. Um, sublimation. Very good, sublimation, right. Predict, observe, explain um, idea is uh, really getting the students to think about what could happen, so their prediction. So we're moving on and we're seeing how dry ice reacts with just normal tap water. But first, predict what is going to happen. And then they make an observation of that experiment and then they try and explain it using some scientific theory or ideas that they've learned. And um, it's a great way to pick up any misconceptions to do with the scientific ideas you're trying to get across. Why was it doing that? What's our explanation? Reuben, have a go here. Um, did the water, because it's quite warm, did it violently heat the ice, which is really cold, so it sort of sped up the sublimation? Yeah, you're, you're onto it. It's a busy day for Matthew and Daniel. Next up this morning, Year 13 Biology. The new curriculum's not so content heavy, and so there is a strong em emphasis on the students' learning and how they learn. The way students learn has changed over the years, with the emphasis moving more onto the student than the teacher. The big change has been moving away from giving students content, 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 into more getting them to think about their learning and how, how they learn. And, teachers taking a step back from being the centre of attention so that the students are doing the activities, they're developing their learning in their own way. For Matthew, this is a busy day's teaching, but not all days are as busy as this one. It'd be unlikely you're teaching five periods or for a full day every day, so you have um, what we call free periods or non-contacts, and that's when you do your planning and your marking and, and other things. It's lunchtime and Matthew takes Daniel to meet with some of his Year 11 biology students. Two years ago, the students tested water in a nearby stream and discovered that it was polluted. They decided to rectify this. Today, they're collecting seeds from native trees, which they hope to plant next to the stream. So the orange ones are ripe. They should be ready. Not poisonous, are they? No, I don't think so. Our teachers often get involved in extra extracurricular activities. It's an ideal way to get to know the students outside the formality of a classroom. Um, it's a much more relaxed environment. After lunch, it's a crash course in forces for the Year 11 physics class. What I wanted to show you was that um, forces are all around us. Next, a practical experiment outside the classroom. All right, so we're going to have a tug of war, shortest versus tallest. Even when I was at school, there was a clear division between the teacher and the student. There is still that boundary and there's still that respect for the teacher, but, um, you know, I can joke with them and have a bit of a laugh. Oh! It did break! I can't believe it! But what I was trying to show you was that this group had a greater mass, all right? So, therefore, they were more likely to be pulling this group, which was a little bit um, smaller in mass, towards them. So the forces were unbalanced. I think it's getting these cool science ideas across to students and seeing the wonder and the awe of it all and them, seeing them mature and develop from year 9 through to year 13. You know, they're almost university students and um, uh, the relationships you build up over five years are you know, pretty powerful. And... So what advice would Matthew give anyone interested in becoming a secondary school teacher? You need to be flexible and a little bit relaxed. 
um, about things. I think you need to let go a little bit and uh, let the students do the learning for themselves. And yeah, be passionate about whatever you're teaching. And I think that comes out as you teach. If you love it, then your students will engage with you and enjoy it as well. So what did Matthew think of his student teacher for a day? Yeah, I think Daniel will be quite good as a secondary school teacher. He's uh, got the confidence to stand up and deliver. He's started building relationships between the students already, which is um, quite important for a teacher. Well, I think I appreciate a teacher's job a lot more now. It was, it's just such a, such a rewarding feeling when you see the students really enjoying themselves and getting into the, the, the topic that you've been talking about. There are two options for study to become a secondary school teacher. You can either complete a specialist subject degree followed by a graduate diploma of teaching secondary or complete a combined specialist subject and secondary teaching degree. For secondary teaching, it is really important that your degree includes two teaching subjects, otherwise you may have to do extra study. Secondary school teachers are in demand, your employment prospects are high. Hey, awesome job, Daniel. Now, there are so many exciting careers out there, and to help you make an informed choice, Salwin from Career Services is up next, and he's got some excellent advice on finding the right job for you. What if you've done heaps of research, worked through your interests and subjects, and still can't identify career direction? Perhaps you could come at it from a different angle. Ask yourself, do I want to work mainly with things, people, ideas, or information? Then you ask yourself, what kind of things? What kind of information or people? Career Services Skill Matcher is a great tool to help you think outside the square. Check out careers.govt.nz for more. Well, that's it for Series 5. Thank you to everyone who's featured in all of our programs. We'll be back again next year with Series 6, where if you still haven't found a career, we'll have 30 more for you to check out, plus more career tips to help you find that perfect job. Now, if you'd like more information about any of the careers featured on Just The Job or more info on how to make that right career choice, jump on our program website, tvnz.co.nz slash justthejob. So good luck, and I'll see you again next year. Zealand on air.